Namaste India. I'm Noor and you're on Outlook Africa. Today, we will be talking about growth, investment and the emergence of the African market. Investors are very excited about Africa. Somebody said, go there, it's the new China. We will make you understand why foreign capitals rush to find their way in the African market. The aim of this series of show is to get the listeners understand the African economy. It's great to have you here. I'm Johan. Stay with us. So what exactly is going on? Has Africa changed? Or is there just so much money slushing about that all the bets are on? Africa is likely to become a solid pole of attraction. African leaders now realize that aid is no longer Africa's only recourse. As one leader puts it, what the continent needs is less sympathy and more investment. That's very right, no, you know, because I think that that's the best lesson a politician can learn from from life, yeah. from the political lifetime, is people don't really need ahead like you know from the past 10 years from the past 20 years you know a lot of european countries and american countries used to bring a lot of head in africa you, they used to bring food and shelter yeah. in africa but what people need today is long-term investment you know we need something which can help africa keep up with its economy for the next 20 years for the next 30 years you know, but we don't want actually someone who can bring us fish. We can bring us. It's like yeah, you know, yeah. th- th- there is actually one say. There is one say which which says, yeah, that if you give me fish, I can eat it for today. Then I will be again hungry for tomorrow. I will come back to you. But if you learn me how to fish, then probably I'm not going to come back to you anymore. So I think that what exactly Africans leaders have understood today that they need more money. I was watching one interview last time on CNN with the Ghanaian president. He was telling City Grub. He was the city bank. He was saying, "This is actually the right time for you to come to Africa." He said, "Come now or get lost in Africa, because now the markets are happening. So many people are really rushing to get to the market. And then, exactly what people need is investment." Yes, uh, it is now largely up to the policymakers to ensure that the growing interest in Africa does not evaporate. You know, into short-lived euphoria. What's going right in Africa? African governments are running policy far better than the West. They are running budget surplus for the middle of the last decades. You know, during the last uh, economic crisis, many African economics have fallen down, but they recovered very quickly, and that's kind of amazing. That's correct, Johan. You know, that was something really magical. You know, the fact African economy have been able to recover very quickly. You know, that's exactly what African (laughs) leaders have understood today. That they need more investment than uh, practical help. And there is actually one concept which have dominated Africa for the past two decades, for the past three decades, which is the Red Africa. The Red Africa is actually a term used to define the the Chinese investment in Africa and the Chinese growing markets in Africa. As you know, if you go everywhere in Africa, in South Africa, in Congo, in Ghana, everywhere across Africa, you have Chinese market, you know. But... What people are starting to ask themselves now is how much of these good stories which are playing in Africa looks more Chinese, yeah. you know. What people don't acknowledge and what people don't understand is that the China itself is only about one-seventh of the African total export, which is nowadays about 100 billion US dollar. And, you know, in Africa, China is in this strong position because it's running a trade deficit with Africa. And that is why you can see China is lending too much money to African government. And they are also somehow trying to encourage African government to employ more and more Chinese construction companies, building roads, hospitals, and everywhere in Africa. So at least China exports something back to Africa. Yeah. Since we are talking about the foreign direct investment, right. How much the growing African economy has benefited from it? That that's a very a very nice question, no, because people will remember and people shall remember that from seventies to eighties, from, from the late seventies to eighties, Africa was running less than half a percent 
in GDP with the support of FDI fund. And in the mid 90s, it came to three to four percent of FDI foreign direct investment in the African economy. And that flow of money from the mid 90s actually helped Africa creating new jobs, creating new markets. Yeah, right, Richie. <laughs> Let's say that money is now available to do infrastructures as well, and the African economy is going to pick up. Yeah, that's true. We already know that the production of oil in Africa is going to go from 10 million barrels a day to about 12 million barrels a day this decade. That, 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 that's really very... Yeah, so it has been a huge boom, you know, mm. in the last 30 to 40 years. Yeah. And all of this took place in South Sahara. In, in South Sahara, in yeah. Africa. That that exactly how I was saying that it took only 20 years, only 10 years that African countries have started realizing, yes. you know, that Africa is actually a new energy heaven, you know. So if you can see some countries like um, Saudi Arabia, if you can see some, some countries like Venezuela, which has been oil and energy heaven for many years. Now, what's happening is even the fear in the international market because Africa is coming, Africa is rising, you know, with at least 10 million barrels a day, and we don't know how much it's going to be in 10 years. It should be very interesting to speak about it in 10 years. So, it's like, you know, the new oil discovery has been made in northern Kenya. So, yeah. this is just part of what people are beginning to discover. Yeah. What is under the African soil? Yeah that makes Africa almost a strong player in a world dominated by the rising demand for energy. For energy, of course. You know, we, we, we today living in a world which is highly dominated by energy demand. You know, you can even see all international conflicts happening everywhere only due to energy. Yeah, that's so, the first priority. So the, the only thing is exactly as you say in the beginning of the show that African government now wants more investment. Because and, what, what, yeah. what we understood is that if we can put that oil revenue into high value, if we can bring it to the international market, to the foreign market, we're going to find it to build our economies. Enjoy the short break. When we come back, we will discuss the US-Africa Summit that was held in Washington from 4th to 6th of August 2014. Stay tuned on Radio Amity 107.8 FM. Hey, 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 See the whole world be looking at us. You are listening to Radio Amiti 107.8, and this is still Outlook Africa. We hope you enjoyed this great song which features many African singers. Outlook Africa is back on Radio Amity 107.8 FM. In the second part, we will open up more sectors in the African economy. But let us first discuss the US-Africa Summit, which came as a surprise to all of us. It was amazing having all African leaders gathering around the US President Barack Obama, whose origin is also traced in Africa. Can the sun of the soil theory still work? What Africans need from the US? How US benefits from this? First of all, let's listen to what President Barack Obama had to say on investing in Africa when addressing African young leaders in Soweto, South Africa. We will see you right after. Uh, our commitment to Africa is based on our belief in Africa's promise and Africa's future, and we want to be part of that future. Second of all, I think everybody should be involved in Africa. I, w I want China, and I want <laughs> India, and I want Brazil, and I want Singapore and uh, well, everybody come on down to Africa because six of the uh, of the ten fastest growing economies in the world are right here in Africa. Uh, you are seeing uh, the uh, a shift inside of Africa uh, in which a commitment to democracy and transparency 
is beginning to uh, take hold. Wow. You know, no, it's very, it's very surprising to see an American president, you know, speaking like this for Africa. As Barack Obama said in the interview, he's inviting the world. He said, I'm inviting the world. I'm inviting uh, every country in the world. I'm invite, inviting British. I'm inviting everyone to come and put their capitals in Africa. So this is actually testifying, you know, the U.S. Africa Leader Summit, which is which was invited by Barack Obama in the United States of America in Washington. As you said, it was very amazing, and it came as a surprise to all of yes, us, like you definitely. said, seeing all Africans present gathering around Barack Obama. So, what that story actually tells us? What it tells us is that Africa is now growing into the international market, you know. That summit only testify the growing influence of Africa in the global stage. And also somehow, somebody can say that the American government, the Obama administration, if not understood, then it's much more value to bring Africa in terms of cooperation and investment. So at least they put money and they get something back rather than bringing them ahead. You know, because the United States of America was in this very strong position for so many years, you know, bringing a lot of money in Africa, bringing a lot of head in Africa. Right, Richie. For a long time, the U.S.-Africa relationship has been largely defined That's by true. unilateralism. You know that aid and trade preference that largely benefit Africa at the expense of the United States. Yeah. Unilateralism implies an unequal relationship where the United States does not really benefit from its dealing with Africa. Such a relationship does not represent the current realities, nor is it a basis for durable and self-enforcing relationship. At the end of this forum resulted in clear action plans and commitment. There were firm commitment by the business executives to expand investment in Africa. You know, it's like uh, many enterprises in U.S. decided to invest in Africa. That was something very, very, you know, you know very interesting that I can say, you know, that Africans, African-American business, American or the origins business have decided to move the business back to Africa, you know. That is something which existed already in the past time. But since the Obama administration came into the machines, we, we have actually faced some kind of slight change you know in the way of africa dealing with the united states of america in terms of business that's good you know? the ge ceo jeffrey emelt on richard quest cnn general electric is one of the largest company in america the company is planning to invest over two billion in africa this is what mr jeffrey emelt ceo of ge had to say on the african emerging market Let's move to the booming mining sector in Africa. Since every Indian has an aim for gold, you know, I mean, they really do. For yeah, gold, you, you, diamond. You, you always know about yeah. Indians. Just look like at the people. jewelry over here. Look, look at how people look. It's look, amazing. Look, it's amazing. Yeah. Look, look at ladies, look at women. Yeah. So many people, they don't acknowledge that without the so-called mining Colson, there could have been no smartphone or electronic of any kind. The world Colson is a mixture of two different mines, columbite and tantalite, which combine in the soil and it is used to fabricate internal circuits for any electronic. And over the whole world reserve stands in Africa. You know, without Colson, no smartphones, and I just cannot survive without WhatsApp. <laughs> that, that, that the hard I question. I mean, WhatsApp. That, that, that really the hard question. People yeah. have it today. How can someone survive without WhatsApp? So they you should know, acknowledge that. You people know. should acknowledge that at least no smartphone can be made. You know, without. if people can can use yeah. Colton. You know, I was. It was very interesting seeing last time on WTA, the World Tennis Association, Women Tennis Association. Sorry. These guys were asking great tennis players like Serena Williams and Maria Sharapova questions yes. like what they do in the morning once they wake up, you know. So it was amazing <laughs> to me. Yes. Then they asked Serena Williams, Serena, what you do every morning when you wake yeah. up? She said, oh, when I wake up the first thing, I check my WhatsApp. You know? So it was very interesting <laughs> yes. to me that no one can survive without WhatsApp. And WhatsApp itself cannot survive without a smartphone. And a smartphone cannot be made out of content. So... Colton is actually something very interesting and as you said, the whole world reserve is in Africa. So you've got all these big corporates in Africa like Sony, like Apple, like Nokia, only yeah, for Colton. Definitely. Nowadays people, they are discussing what's the contribute of China in Africa's growth. Yeah. Yeah. 
that, that's actually the question people are asking today you know how much like i said in the beginning how much of these good stories playing in africa looks more china and you know no a lot of how people a lot of how audience are already drawn in all these commodities and china and oil and money and what people don't acknowledge is that at least 53 percent of growth in africa for the past seven years comes for services you know the mining in africa as you know africa is a mining heaven but the mining the mining revenue in africa it's only down to 14 percent in the african growth so at least 53 percent of the african growth came actually from services you know it has not been china the boom the economic boom in africa has not been china but it has been telecom now the other aspect is as you know no we, we have discussed china as a growing economy we have discussed china as an emerging economy you know for at least 20 years for at least 25 years you know so now africa is also revealing itself you know as a growing economy now the question people are asking themselves is can africa overcome china do you even see that possible coming in the future i guess so <laughs> <laughs> well I think crucial difference that are right now is that the number of Chinese young people have dropped by 20% this decade. 30% down if we take the US Census Bureau estimate. The number of young people are disappearing in China. And what that means this decade, unlike other decade, is that if you want cheap labor to move into textile and light industry, Africa is going to be the source for that labor. Now, let's see the education in Africa, you know, the rising part of Africa. Yeah, education is a very yeah. good part. Yeah. Education is also crucial. If you go back 30 years, yes. less than 10% of people in sub-Saharan Africa had secondary school education. Now, that number has increased to 40%. Yes, Johan, you know, you're very correct, you know, that some slight change which is not happening in Africa. Like you said, 40% is not too much but it's at least something you know and if you can take the analysis what people have done for so many years it now tells that 40 percent is roughly where india was in 1990 and it also where turkey was in 1975. let's take a short break and enjoy this joyful song coco not chocolate outlook africa will be right back on radio amity 107.8 fm
Outlook Africa is back. We are discussing the African emerging market. Let's now move to the democratic phase of the rising Africa. Richie, I've heard many people say that Africa was not safe at all. Correct, you're not the question people are but asking. The problem is many countries in Africa are using the democracy. Yes. They are under democracy. Yes. So they are strong democracy and weak democracy. Weak democracy as well. But still, they are, yeah. democrat they are democratic, democratic countries. countries. You know, Johan, the question of safety in Africa is really something people are debating nowadays. You know, whether Africa is a safer place to go, whether Africa is a safer place to produce capitals. This is exactly what people have started asking today. But as you said, we, we have acknowledged that now many African countries are living under democracy only. You know, at least we've got, like you said, stronger democracy and weaker and democracy. Weaker this is exactly what you have everywhere in the world. But something interesting to and worth quoting is that at least all the emerging markets in Africa, Nigeria, Ghana, South Africa, and all these countries are living under democracies. Correct, Johan. Most of these strategies expanding the threat of war, corruption, and so on are mainly used to discourage investment in Africa, where the whole sector are being occupied by big corporates. One shall not be bound on following people's argument, but try its own experience. These propagandas are also made to impeach the market from reaching the African soil. That, that's true, no, you know, because such kind of propaganda, like Africa is under war, Africa is somewhere under siege, so such kind of things are really made, maybe, to discourage people willing to invest in Africa. Yeah, so we don't trust the propaganda. You don't trust right. it, yeah. So, Richie, people yes. uh, these days, they are discussing that, mm. you know, the... African growth looks much more like Indians. That 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 is true, uh, Noah. You know because the Africa seems actually it seems following a trajectory already done by India. You know uh, what what we know is for 30 years the African growth has been identical to the Indian growth. You know from 1960 to 1990, and we all know and the people we are all aware of what happened to the Indian economy between 1990. Uh, in 2010, you know, yeah. the Indian economy actually grows faster, despite many challenges. We are all aware of it. It kept on going, and as you know, it's not only about the economy, but the African aviation is also rising. It's in a very rising mode. Yes, Richie, uh, it has been over 100 million flights in Africa in 2010. Mm -hmm. 200 million flights are expected at the end of this decade. Africa is also coming up with the best airports and main stage companies such as the Ethiopian Airlines, ah, the yeah. Kenyan Airlines, Ethiopian Airlines. Yeah. you know, flying to over 20 international countries. Mm -hmm. African companies are competing too much at a high level today. You know, the Addis Ababa Airport. Addis Ababa Airport. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it is one of the most luxurious airports in Africa. Everyone is going there, you know, coming, before coming in India, yeah. everybody goes there. Yeah. Because, you know, there is something which has come up in economies, you know, for the past time, people people used to speak about tourism. You know, we, 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 what what the idea we had of tourism? You know, we had in mind that tourism means going somewhere. You know, visiting temples, visiting beautiful places, visiting wildlife. There is what people call today airport tourism. You know, when people sometimes go somewhere, you know, only to see the airport. You know, this is what happening. You know, people get amazed. They want to come often and often. So Africa is actually not coming with such kind of airport tourism with very huge airport in South Africa with beautiful airports in Ethiopia which have become you know like someone can say the epicenter of international flights in Africa so this is something which is really playing in the African growth among young investors to Africa there is someone who made his way through music you know the famous singer the American singer Akon Akon went yeah. on in India Akon <laughs> means business he means business yeah he was among the first to put the capitals in Africa. Now that Africa has revealed to be an enormous market, he's happy about his decision. He should be. Let's now analyze how local entrepreneurs are benefiting from a win-win Africa. We have got many African financial groups coming up in, you know, such as the Zenith Bank. How can African government protect the local business from foreign capitals? You know, that's a big question. This is the question so many people have started talking about. 
no, you know, these are actually very, very, very important questions. You know, because when your economy is in a rising mode, you know, when people, when foreign capitals are rushing into the economy, now the question is, now how we can protect the local market? You know, how we can defend the local producer and the local entrepreneurs? You know, from growing the business into our country. This is something which is actually playing in the mind of people in Africa, but. African entrepreneurs now have understood something. They have also come up with a lot of ideas, with a lot of money. They are also investing too much. There is such kind of dogma like our Africa, our markets, you know, you've got African trying to compete, trying to become also dominant in the African market against foreign capitals. You've just mentioned, you know, the Zenith Bank in Nigeria, you know, which is a hundred percent total African capital. And there is actually a lot of funds in Africa, like the Pan African Securities Fund, such as which, which has been developed by Investec or Stanlib, which is actually a unit of the South African Standard Charter Bank, you know, which is actually becoming a very good competitor in the African market, lending thousands and millions of money in the African market. There is also Imara, which is a South African investment group, you know, which is now offering three big African funds. In two countries mainly in nigeria and in zimbabwe respectively you know so this is yet the largest pan-african amount of money which is coming from south africa with ethos private equity which has at least 750 million us dollars in yeah. the african economy in 2006 so this is actually yeah a time where the african economy is waking up you know people are putting a lot of money and they are trying to take their africa back Let's play you this interview of Dr. Gozi Okonjo, Finance Minister of Nigeria on the African growth, a courtesy of Amanpour CNN. We have a look to what she had to say and we will be right back. Dr. Okonjo Iwela, welcome to the program. Thank you. Great Christine. to have you. Thank Nigeria you. is a huge and important country. We have many, many viewers from Nigeria, always very active and very interested. So it's great to have you here. Thank you. you have said, and others have said, that 2013 is going to be a real game-changing year, mm -hmm. a turning point year for Nigeria, particularly in your area of finance and economics. How? Well, it's going to be a, a, a game-changing point because this is the year we're going to produce results. And we're already producing results within the administration. First, on the economic side, I just want to say that macroeconomic stability has been restored. Now, nobody should minimize that. Remember, there were two lost decades in Africa in the 80s and 90s where there was so much macro instability that people could not even focus on sectors that could create jobs. Now, things have gone right. We've got growth that is at 6.5%. Uh, last year, and we are projecting for 2013 also around the same number compared to average 5% on the African continent. Now, I just want to say that when you mention GDP growth, people immediately say we can, in my country, they say we can't eat growth because we have unemployment challenges to create more jobs, we have a challenge of inclusion, we have problems of inequality. All those are challenges we face. You are obviously a passionate defender of your country. You are a person who calls for transparency and honesty and, and best practices. This is what Dr. Gozi Okonjo, Finance Minister of the Nigerian Federation, had to say on the rising Nigerian economy. She declared 2030 the year of Nigeria. Wow. Wait and see. Let's we wait, look forward to telling see. you the story, you know, after 16 years. I bet some of us are just going to be too People old. People are just going to be too hot. Look at you. <laughs> yeah, 16 years later. 16 years. It will yeah. be very funny, you know. And we look forward to tell the people the story, you know, how <laughs> Nigeria is going to become yes. the world's largest player in the world economy. Long live Radio Amity 107.8 FM. We enjoyed having you in the show. Outlook Africa is over for today. Don't forget to like our Facebook page and follow us on Twitter. The show continues online. Goodbye, Goodbye from, from Noida. Noida.